Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boy oh boy, do I have some build here for you. I've been reading the 2024 Player's Handbook, and by, uh, 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 by reading the handbook, I mean I've been watching YouTube videos, and I've come to some conclusions. And by conclusions, I mean I've adopted the opinions of other people. But of those opinions, there's one I'd like to consider my own. And that is that in the construction of the 2024 Player's Handbook, WotC has seemed to want to disincentivize multi-classing. At least so far as that they've removed most multi-class dip options. The famous hex blade dip has been effectively removed from the game. And there are very few across the board that are still viable, although fighter and paladin seem to work to some degree in terms of dips. But overall, this seems like a good thing. I don't mean it as a, as a hardcore criticism. What I mean is that WotC has effectively made pure class builds so effective that oftentimes multi, multi-classing out of your chosen class is a disadvantage to the build. A pure class build will more often than not outclass a multi-class build of a similar kind. But today, I'd like to undermine that conclusion and fully put it to the test. Ladies and gentlemen, I have come up with the best multi-class build using only the 2024 Player's Handbook rules of all time. Now, I know I've made this promise before, and it was an empty promise. But today, dreams truly do come true. And before your very eyes, you are going to see a build come to life that you thought was nearly impossible. Now, like any build we make on this channel, I like to do something called mid-maxing. And mid-maxing is taking advantage of features that are otherwise underused or might be just terrible, and using them such that they become viable or optimal, and, you know, we just make them work, okay? That's basically the gist of it. With that said, there are a few disclaimers. This build doesn't quite, um, well, the, uh, how do you say, the, prog the progression of the build is not perfect. And you can pretty much approach this in a number of different ways in terms of progression. If you want to front load damage, you can do it in a different way than I present in the, in the video, but ultimately this build is viable at every level. Um, so even if you do follow this and you're thinking, well, at level two, we're not doing much damage. Well, you're still viable. Like, just don't, just, just lock in, okay? It's gonna work out. Also, we're gonna, like I said, use features that are maybe not very good. And of those features are some famous combinations, or at least we're gonna reevaluate some famous combina combinations that Watsi has decided to destroy. For example, the Polearm Master, Great Weapon Master, Sentinel combo that dominated the 2014 Player's Handbook meta, which, you know, was boring in my opinion, not cool, and I'm glad that they adjusted those feats to make them less viable or less mandatory. The particular combo of Polearm Master and Great Weapon Master no longer works the way that it does because you don't get that plus 10 and it's no longer as viable on that bonus action attack. Furthermore, using Sentinel feet doesn't work anymore because they changed the wording of Polearm Master to make it so it doesn't trigger a opportunity attack, it's now a reactive attack. This means that people have completely discounted Polearm Master at least. Sentinel's still strong and Great Weapon Master has its uses, but Polearm Master has been completely thrown in the garbage. So we're going to be reevaluating some of those things today and seeing if there is any value that we can pull out of them. We're also going to be looking at dog water subclasses. And aside from that, just remember that we're also using strictly 2024 Player's Handbook material. Things like Booming Blade will not show up in this build, but just know that if you were to use something like that and other things similar to it, you would be doing exponentially more damage, probably. All right, well, without further ado, let's just get right into it. Level one. For your species, you can kind of go anything. I think you should take something that has a little more speed, so go Goliath. Goliath also has the, you know, the little bit of more damage that you can use, but I'm not going to be calculating that for the purposes of this build. If you don't go with Goliath, I say probably go Gnome. 
Those advantages on saving throws, I think is probably the best feature of any species. For background, it doesn't matter, but we need to go magic initiate because we need to take shield. The shield spell is one of the best spells in the game, and we're not gonna get that spell unless we take it through magic initiate. For ASI, we're going 8, 14, 15, 8, 10, and 15, with a plus one in your constitution and a plus two in charisma. For our level one class, we're going Bard. Now, like I said before, you can start this build in a number of ways, but I still think this is the best way to go about it. Starting off as Bard, you get a few things, Bardic Inspiration, uh, you know, an instrument. You're doing Bard shit. But we're gonna take this class for a number of levels. So let's skip ahead to level three. At level three, you're gonna take your subclass. For this build, we're going the College of Valor. Valor's gonna give us a few things. In particular, we get martial weapon expertise, I mean, not expertise, uh, proficiency. And we get to use shields. You also get some more functions with your Bardic Inspiration, and you can use a weapon as a spellcasting focus. At this point, it's important to put on medium armor, get a shield, and probably use a rapier. This will give us good AC, and we're just basically a regular bard at this point. You're just doing normal bard stuff. You're casting spells, all that kind of thing. And as we progress to level five, now you get third level spells. Take Hypnotic Pattern, take Slow or Fear or Lehman's Tiny Hut. Through these levels, one through five, maybe one through six, just build a bard that is an effective spellcaster in the party. You're gonna want to, again, take spells like Hypnotic Pattern and be effective in that way. But also, rewinding a little bit, at level four, we're also taking our first feat. For our first feat, we're taking a underutilized feat, Shadow Touched. Shadow Touched is a great feat. Shadow Touched allows us to take one spell of the Necromancy school, and that spell we're gonna take is Wrathful Smite. This is the only way to get any Smite spell outside of dipping into Paladin. We will make use of this later on, but for now, at level four, your damage is the following. 1d8 plus 1d6 if you're using Wrathful Smite, plus two because our dex is terrible, so that's an average of about 10 damage, and that's not very good. So, like I said, be a spellcaster, and then use uh, you know, melee when it makes sense. But ultimately, you don't really need to, to be doing that, right? We have Healing Word, you got Aid, maybe Hold Person, Silence, things like that. At level five, we get those third level spells that I talked about. And at level six, we get the extra attack feature, another vital feature of this build. By now, we should have half plate armor and be at around 17 AC plus our shield, maybe that's 19. And um, we have extra attack. This extra attack is not like the extra attack of others, including the Eldritch Knight feature that is similar, but different in a very important way. This extra attack teacher feature allows us to use a cantrip in place of one of our attacks whenever we take the attack action. And as a result, you might be thinking, okay, we should have taken True Strike earlier in this build. No, please do not take True Strike. You have to wait until level seven. But for now, our damage with extra attack when we decide to do that is 2d8 plus 1d6 plus two for an average of 14 damage. Now, our true averages have to factor in our, our hit chance and our miss chance, depending on how you look at it, and our crit chance. And when you factor, when you, you know, factor those numbers in, the true average damage is 11.9. I use the Treant Monk damage calculations to come up with these numbers. You can check his uh, channel. I'll link it here or I'll show it here, whatever. But basically, the math is straightforward but not very entertaining so if you're interested in how to come to those numbers you'll see more you'll see it laid out in a better fashion later on in this build but for now just understand that we're calculating hit chance and crit chance but outside of those damage dice that i'm showing you um, that's how you get those numbers so like i said at level six if you're attacking things you shouldn't be but when you do you're doing an average of 14.5 damage just strictly with the dice. 
but after calculating hit and crit, you're doing about 11.9 damage on average. Now we move on to level seven. At level seven, things start to come together for this build. Number one, we take True Strike. True Strike is an amazing spell and fundamental to this build. It'll add at this point a D6 to every one of our attacks. It'll allow us to change the damage type and it'll also allow us to use our spell casting modifier as damage and hit modifiers. Although that's not strictly important here because we are Warlock and we get an invocation, which will be of course Pact of the Blade. Pact of the Blade will allow us to bond to any weapon or whatever and use our spell casting modifier as the uh, to hit and damage for that. Right now our spell casting modifier is plus four because we have an 18 charisma because if I didn't mention it before, when we took Shadow Touched, we put a plus one in charisma. So with our Pact of the Blade and True Strike, we also get some spells, take like Armor of Agathis or Hex. Just to be clear, I didn't factor Hex into any of the damage of this build, but it would up the damage effectively. Also, this is the point where we can put down the shield and pick up a two-handed weapon. I suggest taking pole, a pole arm here of any kind, glaive, halibird, whatever, but you can kind of use whatever you want until later. I just think you should start looking for, you know, a pole arm that you want to use because that will be the weapon that we use beyond a certain point. Beyond level 10, you're kind of going to be committed. Now, there are other ways to approach this build and I'll, and I'll outline those later in which you don't have to use a pole arm. You can use a great sword or something like that if that's more you're liking. But I say at level seven, pick up a pole arm and start to get involved. The damage is the following. 1d6, sorry, 1d10 plus 1d6 from True Strike plus 2d6 from Wrathful Smite plus four. Then for our second attack, we get to do 1d10 plus four because at this level is where we can start to take advantage of our extra attack feature from College of Valor that allows us to use a cantrip in place of one of our attacks. That cantrip, of course, is gonna be True Strike and that's where some of that damage comes from. The average after hitting with both attacks is 29.5, but average including hit and crit and all of those other things is 22. Moving on to level eight, we take another level in Warlock and we get two more uh, Eldritch Invocations. These invocations are gonna be Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast. We also get the feature Magical Cunning. Magical Cunning basically just lets us get one uh, uh, Warlock spell slot back in between fights, which is important for later, but for now, just, you know, whatever. Agonizing Blast is gonna allow us to add our spell casting modifier to one of our cantrips. That cantrip is going to be True Strike. This effectively allows us to apply our plus four charisma to true strike two times. Once laid out in the spell's description from our attack and twice from, from Agonizing Blast, um, allowing us to add our spellcasting modifier to the cantrip. So that's a plus eight. Here's how the damage looks. 1d10 plus 1d6 plus 2d6 plus eight for our first attack, second attack being 1d10 plus four for a total of 33.5 damage if both attacks hit, or 24.6 total average damage. At level nine, we're taking another level in Warlock and we get our subclass. For our subclass, we're going Celestial Patron. Celestial Patron is not a subclass you're gonna see very often because it's kind of dog shit. It allows you to heal a little bit but, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. We already have those bard spells, and at this point, this is not really significant healing. But it is, you know, something to pay attention to. If you didn't take aid when you took bard spells, you have it now. You have cure wounds, you have things like that. But again, whatever. We're not using any of that shit. We're not really going to think about it. At level 10, we take another level in Warlock, and we get to take an ASI. But in this case, we're taking a feat. That feat is gonna be Polearm Master. Polearm Master, like I said before, has been cast aside by the community, but is, it is more viable than you think. Let's take a closer look at the second line of the feat. Reactive Strike, when you're holding a quarterstaff spear or heavy weapon, reach properties, blah, 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 you can take a reaction to make one melee attack against a creature that enters the reach you have with that weapon. 
in comparison to the old feat, which said, when you're wielding a glaive, halibird, etc., creatures provoke an opportunity attack from you when you enter the reach, when they enter the reach you have with that weapon. This wording is very different. First of all, it references opportunity attack directly, so you're subject to the rules of an opportunity attack, only adjusted by the description of the feat. With the 2024 Polearm Master, you actually are not subject to opportunity attack in any way. And the key wording is that second phrase after the common that says you can take a reaction to make a melee weapon attack against a creature that enters the reach you have with that weapon. A creature enters the reach that you have with that weapon when you walk up to them. They're effectively entering your reach, right? So you can of course take a uh, reaction, a reactive strike using your reaction when you move up to them and they enter your reach again, right? I don't see any problem with this. Now, some of you in the comments or, or if you're watching this now might feel like, wow, man, that's a really generous interpretation of the rules to which I say you're wrong. That's exactly how the rules are written. They may not be intended to work this way, but certainly they are written this way. Now, if you don't want to take advantage of the way they're written or your DM has a different interpretation of the rules, you can certainly take the charger feet in place of the pole, pole arm master feet and you will still do great damage with this build. Both of these feats, but Polearm Master in particular, as we're, as we're going to highlight through the rest of this build, are going to take advantage of the fact that at level 8 when we took Agonizing Blast, we also took Repelling Blast. And Repelling Blast, as well on True Strike, is going to mean that enemies are pushed 10 feet away from us whenever we hit with our True Strike. This means that after they're pushed away from us, we can walk up to them and they enter our reach. Or if you took Charger, you can walk 10 feet towards them, closing the distance that you just pushed them away and the Charger feet will trigger. But again, turn one, we walk up to them, or let's say on a separate turn, we're engaged with an enemy just for the sake of argument. We attack them using True Strike, proccing our Agonizing Blast and our Repelling Blast, it pushes them 10 feet away from, the, from us. We then walk five feet and they re-enter our reach, triggering a reactive strike. We then use our reaction to make that attack. And then we use the second attack from our extra attack bard feature. And the damage is the following. 1d10 plus 1d6 plus 2d6 plus eight. That's plus four from, agon from agonizing blast and plus four from the base true strike weapon damage then our reactive strike, 1d10 plus four, and then our second attack, 1d10 plus four again, for a total average damage of 31.5 damage at level 10. This is fantastic damage, is it not? And it's also worth mentioning, by now we're upcasting our Wrathful Smite. We have the sufficient, uh, you know, what's it called? We have sufficient uh, spell slots to do so, and on turns where you don't have at least level two spell slots to burn a Wrathful Smite, it's probably eventually in this build, not at this level actually, but eventually it will be more worth it to use the D4 bonus action attack instead of the uh, Wrathful Smite 1D6. But just know that you always have a 1D6 in the chamber because you can cast it once per day without using a spell slot. And otherwise you can upcast it to as many levels that you need that you want to. And for the record, we have third level spell slots. But as I said, at level 10, the damage is the following, 31.5 damage. Moving on to level 11. At level 11, we get another invocation, two of them actually. One of them should be an origin feat since we took, uh, a, you know, what was it? Wizard, magic initiate wizard at level one uh, for a background origin feat. You should take maybe the tough feet here or alert, or if you really want lucky or savage attack or something, doesn't really matter. I'd say the tough feet to get more health as we are a marshal. But you're also gonna take Eldridge Smite. Eldridge Smite is gonna allow us to add 2d10 to our weapon attacks, or I'm sorry, 1d10 to our weapon attacks 
1d8 to our weapon attacks and force the prone condition on an enemy. This is pretty good because as it says in the rules of the feature, this does, is not technically a magic action. It doesn't require any action economy and it doesn't conflict with our Wrathful Smite, uh, you know, magic action or bonus action. That means in the same turn and on the same weapon attack, we can Wrathful Smite and Eldritch Smite. And because our, uh, what's it called, our packed slots are level three at this point, we only have two of them, but they are level three. That means our Eldritch Smites are 3d8 and they come back on a short rest and we can get one back using the magical cunning uh, feature. Is that what it's called? Yeah, magical cunning. So I'm gonna calculate this damage as though we're using it all the time. Now in practice, you won't be. You'll have about three of uses of these at this level before every short rest. But I'm imagining you're short resting often and I'm also imagining uh, you know, you're using them all and, um, you know, it was too much work to try to calculate how much it would mean if like you were in a five round combat and you used it twice and then you got one back and then you short rest. Like, I don't want to do any of that. So let's just calculate it as is and pretend you have it all the time, even though you won't. So that's important to realize, but it's also important to realize that we're not using things like, um, what's it called? Like hex is not calculated in this build at all. There are other spells or features you could be using to up the damage a little bit. And we're not calculating advantage that we would be getting from forcing enemies to be prone or instilling the frightened condition on enemies through our Wrathful Smite uh, procs. So at level 11, with Wrathful Smite and Eldritch Smite from our invocations, etc., the damage is the following. 1d10 plus 2d6 plus 2d6 plus 3d8 plus eight on the first attack. Second attack being 1d10 plus four, then another attack, your reactive strike, another 1d10 plus four. For a total on those dice of 60, but an average damage of 47.6 damage per turn. Excellent damage, especially at this level, and especially considering we also have level three spells we have things like Nautic Pattern, we have uh, Versatile Healing, and you know we have Great AC, we have the Shield Spell. Now we've dropped our Physical Shield, so our AC is back to 17, but we're pretty damn good. You also have Armor of Agathis, you have things like that. So yeah, 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 it's, it's great, is it not? I thought so. Anyway, level 12. At level 12, we're taking another level of Warlock and we get our next uh, celestial patron feature. And that feature is Radiant Soul. You link with your patron and every time, blah, 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 I'm not gonna read it. Basically, excuse me, once per turn, you get to add your charisma modifier to a spell's damage. That spell every turn is going to be True Strike. And this is gonna allow us to add our charisma modifier for a third time to True Strike effectively making our True Strike modifier bonus damage a plus 12. So at level 12, our damage appears to be the following. 1d10 plus 2d6 plus 2d6 plus 3d8 plus 12, and then 1d10 plus four and another 1d10 plus four for our reactive strike. That's a total of 64 damage average on those dice, but an average damage total of 50.2 damage. Pretty good, but it gets better. At level 14, we get another ASI. From here on out, you get to choose, do you wanna go Warlock or Bard? I certainly think Bard is by far the more effective way to build this build out. But if you identify more strongly with Warlock somehow, or you see something in this build that's exploitable that I'm missing, then feel free to go, uh, you know, that one, Warlock. But I say, go Bard. So at level 14, we take two more levels of Bard and we get more spell slots and we get Great Weapon Master. Great Weapon Master is a fantastic feat, but is particularly useful on this build. 
Great Weapon Master very specifically says, when you hit a creature with a weapon that has the heavy property as part of the attack action, you can cause the weapon to deal extra damage to the target. The extra damage equals your proficiency bonus. Our proficiency bonus is plus five, so this is very significant damage, but it's important to realize that the, spe that the feature very specifically says, as part of the attack action. Now, if you were to use True Strike on a build like, I don't know, just a, a regular, like on, a, on an Eldritch Knight, or maybe on a Rogue, or not that you'd be using a heavy weapon on a Rogue, but you know what I'm saying. If you were gonna use this on any other build, a Paladin, uh, it wouldn't really make sense to do it, but just follow me. You would not be able to use this because a magic action is not an attack action. Casting True Strike is not an attack, is not part of an attack action. Unless you are a College of Valor bard. Because as it says on the College of Valor level six extra attack feature, you can attack twice instead of once whenever you take the attack action on your turn. In addition, you can cast one of your cantrips that has a casting time of an action in place of one of those attacks. This means that this feature synergizes with Great Weapon Master. And we now get to add our proficiency bonus to our already stacked modifier on True Strike. And the damage is the following. 1d10 plus 2d6 plus 2d6 plus 3d8 plus 17. And then we get to continue to add our modifier on our other attacks. Our second attack is 1d10 plus 9 now, and our reactive attack is the same. For an average damage on those dice of 76, but a total average damage of 59.8. Again, this is fantastic damage. And like I'm highlighting with this extra attack synergy with Great Weapon Master, it's also important to realize that Eldridge Knight, which you might be thinking would be a better option for this build, is actually not a better option for this build. Uh, I'm typing into my, to my um, computer to find the thing very quickly. Basically, I'm not, I'm not gonna look at it. What it says is, first of all, you don't get it until level seven, I think. And second of all, what it very specifically says in the feature for Eldridge Knights, although similar to uh, Valor Bards, is very different. It says you can use a cat, a cantrip. Okay, I'm just gonna read it. When you take the attack action on your turn, you can replace one of the attacks with the casting of one of your wizard cantrips that has a casting time of one action. That means we wouldn't be able to use our uh, agonizing blast with true strike because it needs to be on a, on a what's it called? On a, on a, a warlock cantrip. But the College of Valor makes no such stipulation. It says, in addition, you can cast one of your cantrips that has a casting time of an action in place of one of those attacks. It doesn't say anything about what kind of cantrip it needs to be. So this is truly the only way to make this build work. And it requires a, a sort of careful reading of the rules to allow it to do so. But let's keep going because at level set at 16, that six warlock and 10 bard, we get the almighty feature known as magical secrets. There's probably a few different spells here that make sense to take, but at first glance, there's only one that I really wanted to consider because from here on out, the damage sort of gets just silly. If you take conjure minor, minor elementals, the damage becomes the following. 1d10 plus 2d6 plus 2d6 plus 3d8 plus 2d8 plus 17. Then your, your next attack is 1d10 plus 2d8 plus 9, and your reactive attack is another 1d8, 1d10 plus 2d8 plus 9, for a total of 106 damage, or an average damage of 78.7. That is completely ridiculous, unheard of damage. Imagine if you blow out some crazy crits on an attack. I mean, really the, the possibilities here are endless. But it's also important to realize that this would take setup, right? You'd have to use your action to cast uh, Conjure Minor Elementals, and that would take away from the overall average damage over time. 
But it's also important to realize you're getting more spell slots here and more higher level spell slots, which means you could be upcasting Wrathful Smite. So important to note. But let's do one more level just to look at how silly things truly get. At level 17, oh wow, now that I'm looking at these numbers, they're not even properly calculated. It's actually higher than this because our true strike is up, and I don't think I properly did that damage. Maybe I did, but there's something that seems off here. Someone check the math. I don't know. Whatever. It doesn't matter. It's still ridiculous. At level 17, we get another ASI. With this ASI, we will be maxing out our charisma finally. But our true strike also gets to add another 1d6 because we're level 17. So the damage looks something like this. 1d10 plus 3d6 plus 2d6 plus 3d8 plus 2d8 plus 20. On our first attack. On our second attack, 1d10 plus 2d8 plus 10. And on our reactive strike, 1d10 plus 2d8 plus 10. That's a total of 111 damage, maybe. I don't know. That math seems wobbly. I think it's more. It might not be. But if it's correct, the total average damage is 84.5 damage per round on average. Oh my god, that is unreal. And that's the build. I hope you like it. I mean, it seems like, you know, it works. I don't know. I could be wrong. If someone try to undermine this, there's probably a lot of ways to do it. But it's important to realize, again, I'm not counting Hex. If you went Goliath, I'm not counting that damage. Uh, you know, sure, I'm being a little bit generous on the Eldritch Smites, but I also didn't cast any upcasts past level two of Wrathful Smite. Um, yes, there's an interpretation of Polar Master here that takes advantage of how it's written, but it is written that way. So, you know, I didn't make the rules. I don't know, it's pretty good, right? I don't know, I think so. Anyway, that's it. Love you, bye.